Well, hey, great to have you with us for Thursday morning men's Bible study. And we've been doing a series called uh, Stories BC. Today we're going to look at Zechariah and Mary. And you're going, wait a minute, that can't be true. Wait a minute, that's in the New Testament, isn't it? And it is. But it's still a story BC. So before we jump in, love to have you join us with our online family by simply subscribing. Find that subscribe button below and just hit it and you'll become part of our family. And if you want to add a little bit to that, hit the bell and you'll be notified whenever we have created a new video for you to watch. Well, it is a surprising selection. <clears throat> We're looking at Zechariah and Mary and obviously that appears in Luke chapter 1. And uh, it doesn't seem like it's BC, but it actually is. This is a story that takes place before Jesus is born, BC. And so they're part of the before Jesus family of God that live by faith. And in this great passage of scripture in the first chapter of Luke, we see an incredible contrast that we're probably pretty familiar with between Zechariah and the birth of John the Baptist and Mary and the birth of Jesus and how the two of them respond to the angel Gabriel. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But it's also good for us to understand that what's going on here is really about a family, an extended family. They're related. And of course, Jesus becomes part of the family that he is born into as a, as a Jewish young man. And it also is a very challenging passage of scripture to our theologies. <laughs> Typically, we, you know, we've got them all wrapped up. We've got it put together in just the right way. And here's our little theology, and we put it up on the shelf, and we just leave it there the rest of our lives because we've got it all put together. Well, this is one of those passages that takes our little on-the-shelf theology and just blows it to smithereens because it says stuff. You go, wait a minute, that doesn't seem to quite work, does it? So it takes some explaining. It takes some looking at and be sensitive to what's being said here. So let's go ahead and jump into Luke, <coughs> pardon me, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says this, There was in the days of Herod, king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So these are well-connected men and women, a man and a woman, into the Jewish religion. And it says in verse 6, and they were both, now listen to this, <laughs> talk about blow up our theology, both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Now listen to this, blamelessly. Notice it didn't say there that <clears throat> they were righteous in their own eyes. They're not self-righteous. It doesn't say there that other people thought they were good people. It doesn't say that at all. It says that they were righteous before what? God. And walked blamelessly in his ordinances. Then it says in verse 7, But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, <clears throat> and they were both well off or advanced in their years. Now, first of all, you have to understand, what the Bible is communicating here is it's not communicating that they were sinless. Only Christ was sinless. Let me say that again. You've got to just really understand that. Christ and Christ alone was the sinless sacrifice for us. But it is saying something that sometimes we're not used to kind of understanding. And that is that there were men and women that came before Christ that were godly in God's own eyes, living blamelessly before Him. They were what Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about, the saints of the Old Testament era of B.C., the men and women that lived by faith, and they expressed that through the law, they would fall short of the glory of God. They too would sin. They were not perfect like Christ was, but they always made sacrifice. But they weren't doing the ritual just to be Jewish people. They were doing it out of faith and believing in the coming Messiah who would be Christ. So these are an example of great Old Testament saints of God. Well, you know the story. The story goes on from here to say that Gabriel shows up at the temple that day when Zechariah was serving and announces that he's going to have a son. And, uh, <laughs> and 
Zechariah is just kind of like me or you. We sort of look at the situation and go, wait a minute, Gabriel. You realize how old I am? And my wife, you know, if I'm not old enough, look at my wife. There's, you know, she's barren. There's no way that's going to happen. And so Gabriel has to say to him, listen, if you're not going to believe me, you're going to be struck mute. You're not going to be able to talk until that baby is born, just as a sign to you that God can do this. So that's how the story goes. But in the middle of the story, what Gabriel says is really kind of striking. It's actually amazing what Gabriel says about the birth of John, what he will be like. Now remember, John is a cousin to Jesus. So I want to again emphasize this is about a family, an extended family, what God has done to prepare the way for his holy son Jesus in this family and through that family. So it says in Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Good news, man. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall uh, neither drink wine nor strong milk. And then listen to this. He will also be, again, here goes my theology. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. Even from his mother's womb. Before he's born, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 16. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Being filled with the Spirit. Now you understand your theology about the Holy Spirit? See, it's one thing that happens because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of our faith in Him. We then are have in our hearts, we're given to us the Holy Spirit, abiding in us continuously. That's a beautiful thing. But a second level to that in our theology of the Holy Spirit is that we can then be filled with the Spirit. And it has being filled with the Spirit has a lot to do with what we do, how we act, how we respond. And Paul writes about this in, a, in Ephesians chapter 5, where he says, Be filled with the Spirit, singing songs and having melody in your heart and giving gratitude to God and worshiping Him and being filled with the Holy Spirit that way. He wants us all to be filled with the Spirit. That's something that we have a lot to do with. But what does it say here? It says, he, John, from his very inception and conception will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow, that second level stuff. See, I sort of think about how the Holy Spirit operates in our life like a, a pilot light on a, a gas range. Now with that pilot light, it's always on. So that's the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. But I can turn that baby up, and that flame comes really hot. And that's uh, like being filled with the Spirit. I can take it up. I can take up another notch in my walk with the Lord. But I also can grieve the Holy Spirit by just turning it down to just barely the pilot light sort of going off. I want to have that flame up. I want to be on fire. That's where we get our term, on fire for the Lord. That's second level stuff. But it says of John, and how do you make sense out of this? Even before he's born, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just have the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, all the sense we can make out of it is this. Is this, this is clearly just a grace from God. And this is what I want us to really begin to understand about this passage it is really not so much about Zechariah. We learn stuff from Zechariah, from John the Baptist, from Mary. That's all good. But it's really about God and what He chooses to do in sending His Son. That's a free choice by Him, sending His Son into the world for us. This story, B.C., is telling us a lot about God and His heart for us and that He freely gives to John the Baptist this grace of being filled with the Holy Spirit because he's got a, a big mission to turn God's people back to God. And God's free to do this. God's free to do what he wants. And he chooses to do this 
with not only Zechariah, but with John the Baptist, and then we're going to see also with Mary. His ways are higher than our ways. Okay? So let's look at Mary now. In Luke chapter 1 again, in verses 26 through 28, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel again was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to be married to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, and this is what I want us to tune into, it's verse 28, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That highly favored one, what does that really mean? Well, and I'm, I'm going to quote a Protestant source on this, okay? Because sometimes, if you ever look at a Catholic Bible or Eastern Orthodox Bible, they translate verse 28 as saying something to the effect of Mary full of grace. Well, what's being communicated here? This is what A.T. Robertson, a Baptist scholar, one of the, perhaps the best we've ever had on word studies from the New Testament, understanding the Greek language, the Koine Greek. And he says this, highly favored one is in the perfect passive tense, continuously given a very special favoring from God. It means endowed with grace or enriched with grace, as the word is used in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, of believers, after we have come to faith, that we have been enriched as a grace from God by His grace. And that's what it's saying about Mary. Again, this is a one-off experience in human history. God is sending His Holy Son into the world, and He's preparing a family, a good family, a righteous family, godly people, people of faith, in a very special way. And He has done something with John the Baptist, that's kind of a little off the charts. He does something a little off the charts with Mary. It's a one-off experience. And it has a lot to do with her attitude as well, as we see in verse 38, her response to all of this. Wonderful passage where it says this in verse 38, Then Mary said, Behold, the hand ser handmaid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She willingly submitted to this, as opposed to perhaps Zechariah who was just kind of scratching his head saying, why is this? I don't, I don't even know how it's going to happen. Mary says, well, I, I, don't, I don't get it all, but I do know this. I submit to what you have for me, God. Beautiful, beautiful. She remains a fantastic uh, example to all Christians, men, women, boys, girls, to all of us and how we could respond to whatever God calls us to do. Well, what I'd like to do is this. Get beyond the debate a little bit in regard to Mary and the story. I think Protestants miss something here once in a while because we get involved in this debate where on the one hand, some Protestants are saying, well, Mary, she was just, uh, just a vessel that God used. You know, he, 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 God wanted to use a uh, a, a good, godly Jewish woman, and that's all that it is with Mary. And she's, she's a good person because of it. And then you have the Catholic response that says, no, it's, it's far more than that. Uh, Mary was born sinless, and she was uh, ascended into heaven, assumed into heaven. I just want to put that debate aside and really focus on what I think is going on in this passage of Scripture. First of all, for us, as Protestants, as evangelicals, sometimes we miss this, and it's so huge in the passage itself. Again, put aside the debate. And that's this. It's a family event. It's a family event. These people that we're just reading about, Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, John the Baptist, Jesus, they're all related. They're part of the same family. The human family, we talk a lot about it. It's a good thing. I mean, it's a great thing to talk about our faith family. But sometimes we should maybe think about our own families as well in all of this. That a godly family, a godly family can have a powerful impact in the world. And you know what? 
as I thought about this this week and prepared this lesson, I thought about what the COVID-19 crisis has done to us. We're stuck, <laughs> most of us, with our families 24-7. You know, so often, living the way we do in the 21st century, you know, kids go in one direction, parents go in another direction, grandparents in another direction. <clears throat> Once in a while we get together now, we are living together 24-7. And it helps us. And maybe this is a lesson Maybe this is a lesson from God. You know, I can't tell you what all God's doing with this whole international crisis over this virus. One day we'll know when we get to heaven. But I can say this, we're stuck with our families. And maybe what some of us need to do is tune into that and submit to that like Mary did. Lord, let it be. And maybe we need to learn something about cherishing our family, learning to live together in peace and harmony, living to, learning to live as a godly family together. Wouldn't that be amazing? Could be a lesson from God. The second thing I think that we sometimes miss in this, we get into the debate over this or that in this passage, is that God is in charge of the circumstances. He did something here with... John the Baptist, with Zechariah, with Mary, with obviously Jesus, he did just one time. And he sort of blows up a lot of our theological ways of thinking. He's free to do that. God is free to do that. And maybe that's what he's doing right now in some of our lives. He's sort of blowing up the circumstances and putting us together and a way that we didn't anticipate. And we're all kind of wondering, what's going on? I don't know how to make sense out of this. I can tell you this from this passage. God's in charge. He's still in charge. And he can take a situation that we find ourselves in right now and do something awesome through it. And I want to encourage you with that. If anything this passage says, this B.C. passage before Christ, is that, God's in charge. He has freedom to do what he wants to do. And he is a good God doing good things in our lives. Well, let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this passage of Scripture and this amazing story that sometimes we just sort of set aside for the Christmas season. It's good to reflect on this, particularly the family element, God. All of us, so many of us were stuck in situations that we never thought we'd be stuck in, circumstances that are beyond our control. And it's good to be reminded that you're in charge and your plan will prevail. It's also good to remember that you're, you created the family. It's your institution for the nurturing of children and for the development of men and women as godly leaders. It's the laboratory of life out of which good things are intended to come. So I pray, Heavenly Father, for every family unit that's uh, listening to this broadcast today, that they would be reminded that even though the circumstances may be difficult right now, it's a challenging time where we can be, be molded more into the image of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe and join us again.